Well, we are continuing in our masterclass in Luke, where we've been going through Luke's gospel with an ear to how it is that we as apprentices of Jesus, which is a way of thinking of discipleship, we who are learning about who Jesus is, learning from the teaching of Jesus, learning from the example of Jesus, how we might follow him as his apprentices. And that's kind of been the framework through which we've been thinking about the gospel of Luke. And that's why we called it the masterclass in Luke as we dive through. Well, today's story features amazing healings on the part of Jesus. And as I was studying this passage, I found that a lot of questions were coming to me. A lot of somewhat unsettling questions, maybe disturbing questions that came up for me as a follower of Jesus who also prays for people a lot. Praise for people who receive healing. Praise for people who are struggling. And I don't just do that because I'm a pastor, lest you think that's true. I, I think that's part of our role as followers of Jesus, that we pray for one another. We pray for people. And so, as a person who does that, this question started coming up as I looked at the story today. It's a famous story. It's a story I love very much. But here's the question. How is a follower of Jesus, who knows that Jesus is Lord over sickness and death, which we believe, we confess that, how is it that there's still so much sickness and death? Exactly. And more questions just kind of piled on for me. Why is it that many people pray for healing but don't get healed? I mean, some get healed, and we are thankful for that. We celebrate that. But lots don't. Why? Um, how is it that Jesus, who healed the sick with a word or a touch when he was here, seems slow, slow to act now. How are we to understand healing as well as suffering as apprentices of Jesus? We who are called to preach Jesus and pray for the sick, and yet we don't often see the kind of results Jesus seemed to get. I mean, should we be praying for healing? Or should we... Mm, mm, eh, Maybe, maybe not. Maybe refrain a bit. Hold yourselves back. How much should we pray for it? Or how much should we expect it? And then, ha, the million dollar question, what do we make of all the opinions of all these different Christians about healing or about the reasons why people aren't healed? You've heard some of them, I'm sure. <sighs> well, all these questions were running through my heart and my mind as I prepared this message. Because, and here's why, because I know you. Because I actually am privileged to know what some of your stories are. And I know that some of you are suffering with chronic illness and pain and suffering. And you have been praying and have prayed. And many people have prayed, cried out to God on your behalf to heal and yet for whatever reason, nothing's happened yet, and you're still experiencing daily suffering. And I, I know this to be true. I also know many of you who have prayed for the healing of loved ones as you watch them suffer and then die. Right? I know some of you have received profound healing in one area of your life only to see not get it in another area. And it feels really awkward and really odd to say, yeah, there's this incredible response, this incredible miracle, and yet over here I, I can't seem to, nothing seems to be happening. And I know that there are some of you who do wonder, does God even hear you in your pain? Does he, is he aware? Does he care? And I want you to know that I hear you and I know that is true of you and, and in your lives. And I want you to be able to trust Jesus more deeply. To know that he is Lord over sickness and suffering. Even when suffering continues. Even when the sickness isn't always healed. Maybe isn't often healed. And certainly not as often as we would hope. Because this story today is a wonderful story of Jesus and his lordship over sickness and death. And it has so much to tell us. There's an invitation here for us wherever we're at, whatever we're experiencing. So let's dive into it. Now, this is where your mind has to do a little bit of tracking with where we've been. But you might remember 
that before the message that Valerie preached, there was a cluster of stories. I'm doing the third one of the cluster. But there's something in these stories that Luke has gathered together that kind of puts the lordship of Jesus front and center. First, we have Jesus calming the raging storm, right? Coming across the Sea of Galilee. They're caught in a storm. Disciples are freaking out. Jesus calms the storm, and he reveals his lordship over creation. This is God in the boat. He is the Lord, and everyone's stunned by by this, terrified by it, in fact. But then, getting out of the boat, Jesus and his disciples are confronted not by a raging storm, but by a raging man. And Jesus demonstrates his lordship there too, as lord over these spiritual forces of destruction, by also lord over the spiritual forces of restoration, as he, as he cleanses and restores this man. This man is now whole and healed, clothed and in his right mind. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of Jesus using his immense power for good, which is the only way Jesus uses his power. He's the Lord. Well, now in the story that we're examining today, Jesus has gotten back in the boat, left from his very short-term mission trip uh, across the lake, and, uh, you know, go there, heal a guy, kill some pigs, go back home. And then he's immediately swamped by this huge crowd. And among them, there are tremendous needs, and two stories are told in the form of a dying girl and a sick woman. A well-known story for some of you, but for some of you, it might be new. Let me read it for you. Um, And uh, I'm reading from Luke chapter 8, verses 40 to 56. Uh, I do encourage you to read along. If you have a Bible, there's Bibles in your your seats and on your phone, wherever. Here it goes. Now, when Jesus returned, so from the Galilee, across the Galilee trip there to Gadarenes, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, uh, Peter said, Master, uh, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, uh, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, Your daughter is dead. He said, don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. What a story, hey? It's an incredible story. I love it. It's the sandwich thing going on with the story and then the story inside the story and then the story and lots of, woo, there's a lot of stuff you could dig out of this one. It's a beautiful study you could do together with friends. And what we see here is that Jesus is the Lord over sickness and death. I mean, this story just highlights that. Look at his power here. Restoring this woman who had been sick for so long. Raising this girl who everything, you know, was dead, obviously, and, 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 and yet he raised her to life. And Luke wants us to see this very clearly here. Just as Jesus was Lord over the raging chaos of the sea and this man's soul, demonstrated that he is the Lord. 
He's God in the flesh. He's the one who, through his word spoken, has power over forces seen and unseen. He's also the Lord over sickness and death. He has the power to heal the sick and raise the dead, and it's, this, this story is proof positive of it, of who Jesus is. So Luke is trying to say to us as his followers, us as the readers, look at Jesus. This is God here, walking, talking, healing, restoring. This is God in the flesh. This is God who is present. Jesus is the living word of God who speaks, who creates, who rebukes and restores. He is the Lord. And that's what this story is intended to do for us as listeners and as readers. This story is meant to fill us with trust in his lordship as we see him again using his immense power to bring restoration and healing to people as he always did. We, we dug into that even more in the story a couple weeks ago about uh, this, this man who was demon-possessed and, you know, the story of the pigs. Um, we explored in more detail how God always uses his power. Jesus always uses his power for good, and we see it here again. And this story is meant to, to shore up our faith. It's meant to encourage us. It's, it's, it's meant for us, especially when we're feeling, uh, we're not sure. And, and we're, we're, we look at our lives and we look at the mess around us and we think, is God really good? Is Jesus really the Lord? And the story like this is meant to actually buoy our spirits and hold us up and encourage us. But we can trust Jesus to heal the sick and restore the outcast and raise the dead. He's got the power to do it. And he's promised that he will do it for anyone who places their faith and trust in him. The question is, when? Right? I mean, for those who have faith in Jesus, and I'm not assuming that all of you do, but for those of you who have faith in Jesus, who trust him, the question is really comes down to, yeah, okay, but when? It's a question of timing. Because we hear a story like this, and it's meant to grow our faith and our trust in Jesus. And so we pray for someone now, and some are healed, and some aren't. And we think, what is going on here? What's the timing here? How does this work? We trust Jesus, but that doesn't mean that no one ever gets sick. Have you noticed that? It doesn't mean that no one dies. In fact, this girl who was raised from the dead on this day, She's been dead a long time. I don't mean that harshly. I just mean the fact is, even Lazarus, the hugest miracle of resurrection that happened and told in John chapter 11, Lazarus grew old and died. So death is coming for everybody. So even, even in this case, Jesus demonstrates his lordship over death, and yet it wasn't complete in that sense, staved off. Maybe they also got sick later too. It, it isn't as though Jesus demonstrating his lordship over sickness and death in these stories meant that they were never sick again or that they never did die. In fact, they all did. And us, when we have prayed with faith for Jesus to heal and to touch people, and I know that many of you have, we see that many people still continue to suffer. Many people don't get healed. And many people, very sadly, still die earlier than we had hoped. You know that age, this is too young. This is too young. So what does it mean then that Jesus is Lord over sickness and death? Can we affirm that this is true? Can we affirm that Jesus is Lord over sickness and death even in those times when it seems like he's not healing at least according to the time frame that we would have li liked and hoped? People have offered a lot of opinions about why this is true. Um, let's see, I'll just toss out a few of them today, okay? because I, I think it's important to point something out, because especially for those of you who have struggled, like you've had um, a sickness in your life or someone in your life who's been sick, you've been told things. And I think it's important to call, call some of them out. One opinion that keeps cropping up, perhaps you've heard it, uh, one that is very, uh, I'm just going to be real bold this morning and say very foolish, very faulty, is that the simple reason why is that the people asking for healing don't have enough faith. Have you heard that one? don't have enough faith, they say. It's an attempt to let God off the hook, is what it is. So they've locked themselves in a view that says God's going to heal every time there's enough faith, because hey, look at Jesus. So then if there isn't healing, well, they're not going to blame God. No, one's a, no one wants to do that except Job. Uh, and, and so, you know, well, it can't be God, so let's, well, let's blame the person that is praying. They don't have enough faith. 
I mean, Jesus told her it's her faith that healed her. So I guess you didn't have enough faith. I mean, they might not say it as bluntly as that, but they'll try to kind of pass it off as that. But the truth is the scripture doesn't support that. What we see in scripture is, yes, faith in Jesus is essential, but it's not like there's a quotient, you know? Like there's a, there's a line in the bucket. You gotta get your faith up to that line, you know? And if it's not at that line, too bad for you. It's only the few people that can get about that line that really get the things they want. But that's not what you see in the scripture. In fact, Jesus talks about, man, you just need the fraction of the tiniest little bit of faith. In my opinion, anyone who just says, Jesus, help me, has got enough faith. It's not like you've got to have more. A tiny mustard seed, you can move mountains, Jesus said. And this woman in, in this story, I mean, she demonstrates a lot of faith. But in other ways, she's hiding in the crowd. And I'm not diminishing her at all. We could, I, I'm not preaching about her today, but there's a lot in there. But her reaching out to touch his garment represented incredible boldness, but also... She thought, a little bit of faith. I'm going to touch his robe. And she was healed. It was marvelous. This idea that you've got to have faith, you've got to have more faith, and you, if you would only just sort of conjure up enough trust and enough faith, and as a result, we have all seen people that, boy, they go to great lengths to demonstrate that they've got the faith that's needed, and they, uh, well, some of them are dead. And I, I mean that harshly. I, don't, I do not mean that. These are people I love. But it's, it's not like, I mean, I, they had lots of faith, friends. They had way more faith than I did. They didn't get healed. So I, don't think that faith, I don't think that's an adequate question. I don't, I'll answer, and I don't think the Scripture supports that. Um, another common explanation is that it's, it's personal sin that's preventing healing. Have you heard that one? Yeah. Now, this one is a little trickier uh, because ongoing sin does have ongoing effects in someone's life. Uh, and, and that can be physical. And I, I just want to acknowledge that. If you harbor deep-seated resentment for your mom, and you're unwilling to confess it and turn away from it, but you just seethe and roil in that resentment every single day you get up, you are going to have a hard time receiving the healing that Jesus may want to give you. I just want to acknowledge that. Our lives, our whole living soul organism is a complex interplay of emotion and, and, and where we are spiritually and our bodies and our health. It's a, it's a big deal. We are whole people. And so what goes on inside of us does affect things. I, I don't think we can deny that. And confessing sin, what's more in the Bible, is an important part of healing. We, we are to confess our sins to, one, to one, each other and, and pray for one another and so confessing sin can be a very, very significant part of praying for each other's healing. I think that's really important. See why I say it's a little bit tricky? And what's more, of course, if, if you've been traveling in the Christian story for a while, if you're a person of faith, you know that in some ultimate sense, kind of in the macro sense, all suffering and all uh, physical ailments and all difficulties we have, they're all connected somehow to sin, right? We live in a broken world. And so all violence and all suffering and all breakdown, it's all connected somehow to the fact that this world is still sinful and broken and Jesus has not yet fully redeemed it. So in that sense, sickness and suffering can still be connected to sin somehow. But, and here we, we need to offer a really big but, to suggest that any and every sickness especially that a sickness or a malady that, that is not being healed through prayer or through therapeutic interventions, to, to sometimes you say, well, I don't know, you might not know what it is, but obviously you've got some unconfessed sin in your life or else you'd be healed, is a, a bit of a problem. I mean, not only is that contrary to Scripture, but it does nothing to help the person. It, it only crushes them. It essentially is doing the same thing as the other lack of faith thing does. It just throws people back on themselves and say, well, too bad for you, you know. Jesus really wants to heal you. I know you can't figure out what it is, which is the sign that the Holy Spirit's not doing the convicting here. The Holy Spirit will show you. If you ask, the Holy Spirit will show you what's going on. It kind of throws people back on themselves and kind of shames them for their lack of healing. Well, that's not good news. And that's not what we see in Jesus. We all have sin in our lives. Everyone who came to Jesus for healing was sinful and had sin, unconfessed and otherwise. And so people who came to Jesus for healing, we who come to Jesus for healing today we can sometimes experience healing that then leads to further holiness, and sometimes Jesus wants to correct something in us that can lead to healing. There's a dynamic at work there. But this simplistic idea that you are not being healed because, well, you must have unconfessed sin is similar to, again, what's going on with Job and his friends who had this answer for his suffering that wasn't actually true. 
Well, you might have heard versions of that among some Christian groups who hold a faulty theology um, about healing or about sickness. This is particularly popular among people. I was raised with some of this. People who have a, a, sometimes they call it health and wealth. Have you ever heard that? Jesus wants you to be rich and healthy. And, uh, and so the prosperity gospel, this idea that if you believe in Jesus, you ought to be just rolling in dough um, and everything should be great for you, ignoring the testimony of scripture and down through the ages that some people who come to follow Jesus, their life gets considerably worse. Have you ever seen that? Anyone? Yes. And so, uh, in fact, you might get a lot poorer because you follow Jesus. And so this, this, sometimes there's some faulty theology that gets out there. People start claiming things about, you know, with this really, really clear definitions of who's in, who's out, what do you, what do you need to do, all this kind of thing, because they really want to say to you, if you're sick, if you're suffering, there's something wrong with you. Rather than acknowledging what might be true is a little more complex than that. Hey, there's one other group I want to highlight before I go on. Um, there's another group of folks around, I have some friends in this category, who just would just say, well, I don't think God heals anymore. Um, you know, God, yes, Jesus established power over sickness, and yes, these miracles we read about are, are real, but that day is behind us. You know, they had a purpose to establish who Jesus was, but now the work Jesus does is more about healing us from the inside, not really the outside. We shouldn't expect Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit to be doing anything too miraculous this, these days. I mean, he might, but that's just a bonus. Don't expect it. Um, the real work of God is happening inside. But that doesn't quite square with Scripture, and it doesn't quite uh, square with Christian experience either. Obviously, we want to emphasize the importance of inner healing and the work that Jesus wants to do in us, right? And I would like to argue that, uh, you know, there are many times when I think that's actually more miraculous. I think in some ways beating cancer would be a lot easier than beating hatred. And, and I see that in people's lives. But this teaching, it, it, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem to square, and there's further arguments here, with, with what we see in, in the life of the church and in the, in, in the scriptures, that Jesus still does heal today and, and, and wants to. Those are some of the options that we can hear and more, I'm sure. But the truer answer, the fuller answer, probably the more complex answer, but the better answer that bears out in the whole of scripture, but also through Christian testimony is this, that Jesus is Lord over sickness and death, whether we experience healing in the short term or if we have to wait till resurrection. Jesus demonstrates his power over sickness and death. He demonstrates that through his ministry all the time, but ultimately through his death and his resurrection. And he is guaranteed, through his death and resurrection, he is guaranteed to bring an end to all sickness, all suffering, all crying, all death, when all things are reconciled to him when the new heavens and the new earth have been established, when we are all raised to life from groaning bodies to glorified bodies, and we're not subject anymore to suffering and sickness and death because he is the Lord over it. In other words, whether it's today or tomorrow or at the end, we are going to be healed, period. And Jesus' gospel ministry is meant to give us the confidence that whatever things are like in the short term, Jesus is the Lord, and he will restore. He will cleanse. He will heal. He will raise us up in the end. And we will experience some of that now in various shades. But whatever happens now, the ultimate outcome is absolutely guaranteed. I've been reading a great book, in fact, the best book I've ever read on grief, which Rose Wheat lent to me. I'm almost done, Rose, and I'll get it back to you. The author experienced tremendous loss in an accident. Lost his wife, his mom, and his daughter, all in the same accident that he was in and other kids. It's, it was a horrific experience. And uh, this book called The Grief Disguised, I recommend it to any of you. But I was reading just last week as I was preparing for this, and I thought, ooh, that's a good one. So I'm going to bring a little bit of a longer quote to you that I don't normally do, but uh, let me read this for you because I, I was really struck with Jer what Jerry was saying. He said, In his earthly ministry, Jesus performed signs and wonders as signs of God's presence on earth. The deaf were made to hear, the blind to see, the lame to walk, and the dead to live again. But sooner or later, those who had had their healing restored went deaf again. 
If not before death, then obviously in death. Those who had been given sight went blind again. Those who were made to walk went lame again. Those who were given life died again. Suffering and death won out in the end. In other words, Jesus' miracles were not the ultimate reason for his coming. His great victory was not his miracles, but his resurrection. The grave could not hold him. So perfect was his life. So perfectly sacrificial his death. Jesus conquered death and was raised by God to a life that would never die again. The Easter story tells us that the last chapter of the human story is not death, but life. Jesus' resurrection guarantees it. All tears and pain and sorrow will be swallowed up in everlasting life and pure, inextinguishable joy. Now, does this mean we will never see miraculous healing? No, it doesn't. We will. And because we believe that Jesus is Lord over sickness and death, we can come full of faith to Jesus and ask him to heal us. We can ask him even to delay our death. I think it's actually good and right to pray this way. But we place our faith in Jesus. We don't place our faith in the results. We don't place our faith in a certain kind of answer. We don't place our faith in the healing. We don't even place our, our, our faith in prayer. People say, I believe in prayer. I always say, I mean, gently, I don't believe in prayer. I believe in God who hears our prayer. Locate your faith in Jesus. Not in positive vibes or declarative prayers or big shows of extravagant boldness. That is not true faith. We have faith in Jesus. We come to Jesus and we reach out our hands to touch him. We know that his touch heals all. That his power is what raises us. And when we don't receive the healing or the answers that we wanted in the time that we wanted them, we continue to trust in Jesus because he has shown himself to be the Lord over sickness and death one way or the other. He's still the Lord. He is going to heal. Somehow he is going to use this sickness and this death for his glory and for our good one way or the other. And we begin to understand, and this is why it's so important to have a theology of healing and suffering that goes together, we understand that somehow suffering is part of the current story that God is using to receive glory and bring good to our lives in a world that is still groaning in bodies that have yet to be resurrected, but we look to the day when all will be renewed. This is why uh, I asked Jan to read from Romans 8 just before the message where we hear about how Paul, Paul says, I don't even compare the present sufferings I'm experiencing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Not even a comparison. It's hard for us when we're suffering to think that that's true, isn't it? And then he talks about how everything's growing. Our bodies are growing. Creations are growing. The spirit's growing. The spirit of God within us is growing. There's a lot of groaning going on. As we look forward to the day when we will be redeemed, when our bodies will be raised, when the earth will be recreated, when things will be right. But in the meantime, the Spirit is helping us in our weakness. And we don't know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. He is at work, and we know at the end, we know that all things God works together for the good of those who love him. That God actually is at work in the suffering. In the times when we're not receiving healing, God is just as much at work there for his glory and your good as he is when he works to bring more quick healing. Can you believe that? It's hard to believe, I know. But those of you who have suffered, some of you for decades, know this to be true, that often there are ways that only through suffering, only through waiting, only through delay, have you come to understand who God truly is, his grace, his love, and his power. I don't say that to minimize healing, but to say that whether we are healed immediately or whether it lingers or whether we wait to the end, God is still in love with us and working it out for our good. Jesus is still Lord over sickness and death because he's the Lord over it all. So where does that leave us today? I'd like to invite you back into the gospel story and I'd like to pray with you and allow you an opportunity to pray this morning. First, for those of us who are here 
or with us online who would say, I need healing. Like, I am hurting. There's something wrong. Could be physical. Could be mental. Could be emotional. But you're recognizing, I need healing. Or you've been praying for something specific and you would love Jesus to heal you, to touch you. And I want to invite you just imaginatively into the story of this woman in the crowd. This woman who had tried everything and had had no results. This woman who weaves her way through the crowd and reaches out to touch Jesus' robe. And I just want to invite you wherever you are at, and particularly for those of you, you know who you are, who are in that place of really, really needing Jesus to heal you, wanting to receive. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just invite you to close your eyes. And um, if you're in that place today, in your mind's eye, see yourself waving through that crowd and approaching Jesus from behind. And I, I just invite you to look, look to Jesus and place the full weight of your trust on him. He is good. He is good. He knows your situation. He knows your pain. And he cares for you. And he's not ignoring you. He really knows and understands in a way that no one else does what you are experiencing. And so I invite you just to look to Jesus now, who is your Lord, who cares for you, who has all power and has done everything necessary for your healing and for your resurrection and for your good. And, and so in your mind's eye, I just invite you to, in faith, reach out, trusting in Jesus, reach out your hand and touch the edge of his garment in full trust and ask Jesus for healing. Express your trust in him and your trust in his goodness, your trust in his love for you. And ask him boldly. Just ask him simply. You don't have to hold back. He wants to hear from you. So I invite you just in a moment or two of silence, just to, in your own heart and mind, ask Jesus for what you need. Lord Jesus, just as on that day in the crowd you felt power go out from you, you know each one of us who have come today and asked you for healing, for restoration, have asked you to intervene, you know. And so, Lord Jesus, I just pray that um, each one who has asked you that today would hear and see your response here in this story as your response to them today. That they are seeing that um, he knows their story. That he looks at them, he looks at you today and says, your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you whole. You can go in peace. And I pray that as uh, we hear those words today, Jesus, we would, we would be filled with a greater, uh, a greater experience of, your, of, of trust in you, a greater, a greater sense of your, your kindness toward us. That by trusting in you, you are the one who heals. And we can fully trust in you. We can go in peace. We can go in wholeness. And I pray that that would be true for each one. Amen.
Second, for those of you who are struggling with the slowness of Jesus' response, who have prayed in faith, maybe even now you prayed for something that you've prayed for a lot. You've cried out for help, but it feels like, and you know you're not supposed to say this sort of thing, but let's just be honest, Jesus is really dragging his heels. Like, come on. Why does it have to be so long? And this could be for yourself, but it could be for someone else. And I again want to invite you into this story, but this time the character of Jairus. Think about Jairus, who's come, who meets Jesus, who falls down and begs Jesus to respond. And Jesus responds. Jesus is coming, right? And he's walking along with Jesus. But now he's having to stand there and wait for Jesus to talk to this woman. Anyone? Come on. She's been healed already. Like, let's move on, right? So Jesus has taken the time to listen to this woman's story, and Jairus is dying inside because his daughter's dying at home. But finally, Jesus wraps it up. But by then, it's too late. By then, continuing to walk with Jesus, Jairus finds out that the daughter's already died. And I know I'm playing with the story a little bit here, but I want you to take that moment, that moment while Jairus is waiting with Jesus, walking with Jesus. From the time he asked Jesus to heal his daughter to the end of the story when Jesus does. I, I want you to take that moment when he's with Jesus and somewhat imaginatively extend it. Just extend it through time. Because in some ways, that's, that's a way of thinking about our own experience. We've asked Jesus for help. We're now walking with Jesus toward the time when he will heal. But in this intermediate sp experience, there is delay. We're walking with Jesus. He is the one who has lordship over sickness and death. But our daughter at home who was dying had just died. And somehow in there, I know, in this story, in the gospel story, it's collapsed. Jesus just shows up, ba bam ba bam But in our experience, sometimes that time period, it's longer and longer between when we've asked Jesus and when he finally responds. And it could be that for you, you need to sit in that moment and realize that, Jesus, I don't understand why you're taking so long to answer this. I don't get why. I'm, I'm, I'm still walking with you. I still trust you. I don't get why we haven't arrived there yet so that it's done. You know my pain. You know what's going on. I don't understand. But somehow it's in that journey with Jesus that we hear his words to Jairus when he says to Jairus these powerful words, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. And I know it can feel like that is not very, uh, that's not the message I want to receive when you think, yeah, this promise that she will be healed or that they will be healed or that this situation will be resolved is something that is going to happen, but just not yet. I know that can feel even extra painful. But somehow in the midst of that, walking with Jesus and hearing his words. He knows our situation. He knows the pain you're experiencing. He knows exactly what's happening in your life. He literally went to the cross and rose again to resolve that exact situation. He knows it. And so if he's calling us to walk with him, to not be afraid, to just believe and hold in our hearts and our minds the promise that she will be healed, he will be healed, we will be healed then we have to embrace that moment and say, Lord Jesus, I don't understand why it's taking so long, but I am going to continue walking with you down this road. Hearing your words to me, just don't be afraid. Believe, trust in me, she will be healed. And know that somehow, in the mystery of how God's works and for our good and his glory, that promise of healing is absolutely guaranteed. But the call to trust is on the road with 
Jesus. And so, again, I want to invite you to take an, a moment to pray this prayer. And I invite you to close your eyes again. For those of us, and uh, it might be the same folk, uh, it might be others who have found themselves struggling with the delay, struggling with um, how long it's taking. In this moment, Lord Jesus, I pray that they would receive a deep sense that your care for them that your lordship over their lives, that your awareness of what... None of this delay represents a lack of interest or love in your, in your case. And we, in our lives, as we suffer, as we long to see healing and restoration come to people's lives, as we, we don't want to see people that we love die, Lord Jesus, I pray that in the midst of that, each one, particularly those today who are wrestling with the slowness of your response, I pray that we would hear your words, your invitation here to not be afraid, to trust in you and know that you have promised healing. You have promised restoration. And we may experience that soon. But our hope in you means that we know it's coming regardless. And so Jesus for each one of us who are experiencing that delay, that slowness, I pray that you would minister to them. And I invite you now to just take a few moments um, in silence and to just express your trust to Jesus, express your trust in him, that even in this delay, you will not be afraid. You'll trust in him and know that whatever this situation is, whatever sickness or suffering, ultimately that will be resolved in Jesus. Ultimately, we will be healed. So just take a moment to express your trust in him. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord, the Lord over all, the Lord over sickness and death, the Lord of resurrection, <laughs> Lord of love. Lord Jesus, we confess that in the midst of our lives, there can be times where it feels, times where it feels like life is only suffering. I ask, Holy Spirit, that in the midst of our struggles, we would experience your joy. I do pray, Lord, you would increase our boldness as we pray for healing, as we ask that you would work and move in people's lives and hearts, that we would extend hands to one another and pray with simple trust in you for your movement in our lives. Lord Jesus, may our faith be in you. May our trust grow in you. May we hold with unshakable confidence to the truth that you are the Lord over all and that there is coming a day when all sickness, all tears, all suffering, all pain will be gone, when the last enemy to be destroyed, which is death, will be crushed, and all will be well because of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.